let's talk about the first topic of calculus which is differential calculus calculus in itself is a vast branch of mathematics which you will study in detail in 12th standard calculus has widespread applications in physics and just like vectors it is inseparable from physics all the major domains of physics like mechanics electrodynamics optics etc utilize calculus in some form in this video we'll talk about differential calculus in more detail the main use of differential calculus in physics is as a rate measurement tool we'll look at this idea in more detail so it happens very often in physics that we have the rate of change of one physical quantity with respect to the other happening for example let's talk about speed which can be expressed as distance upon time in other words i can read this as the rate of change of distance with respect to time and both of them are physical quantities so differential calculus and the tools of differential calculus can help us understand this rate of change let's talk about this through a couple of examples let's say the first case we have a car going on a highway at a constant speed i draw the graph of the motion of the car with respect to time so over here i have a distance time graph and this is the plot i obtain for the car's motion you can see here that for equal times that pass the car travels equal distances which means at at a specific interval of time the same distance is traveled so in that situation i can say that y1 minus 0 upon x1 minus 0 is equal to y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1, y3 minus y2 upon x3 minus x2 and so on. Why am I saying this? Because the numerator is nothing but the difference of two distances which means the distance covered and the denominator is nothing but the difference of two times which is the time taken. So all these are the ratios of distance covered upon time taken which essentially gives me speed and the speed is constant so all these ratios are exactly same with each other. Now let's talk about the second case when the car is not traveling at constant speed. So in this case let's assume that the car is not traveling at constant speed rather it is traveling at an increasing speed. If I draw the distance versus time plot for the car in that situation, the graph I obtain is something of this fashion. You can see in this graph that for the equal amounts of time that pass, the car is traveling more and more and more distance, which means the car's speed is increasing. More amount of distance is the same amount of time as the time passes. So I can say that none of the ratios that represent speed here, which is y1 minus 0 upon x1 minus 0, y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1 and so on will be equal to each other. The rate of change of distance with respect to time is never same or in other words speed is never same. In order to analyze these situations, I, I take the use of differential calculus and I understand that there are two kinds of speeds involved in this case. The first kind of speed is the instantaneous speed, the speed of the car at any given instant of time. That speed can be found out. The second kind of speed is an average speed that from t equal to 0 to t equal to a final value, what was on an average the speed of the car. To find out these two informations, I will take the use of differential calculus. To analyze this more, I will take the same graph and I, I, and I will plot it on a separate xy plane. Now in this situation, I have uh, chosen two points on x arbitrarily, x1 and x2 and y1 and y2 points are corresponding to x1 and x2. Bear in mind, this x1, x2, y1, y2 have nothing to do with the values in the previous graph. So over here, if I have to find the average rate of change between these two points, I can simply write it as y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1. I can also write it as delta y by delta x because you know that delta simply represents a change and over here delta x is the separation or the change between x1 and x2. Similarly, delta y is the separation between y1 and y2. So the same uh, expression can be written in that format. If I draw a line passing through these two points, I can approximate as if the particle in question or the car in question was moving in this line, it would have had the same value of average velocity. So if I just draw this line over here, this black line that you can see, I can say that between these two points, it appears as if the car was traveling on this straight line, if I use this formula for my uh, speed. However, we know that the car was not traveling on this line, the car was actually traveling over this curve. And I am interested in the instantaneous velocity or instantaneous speed at any point on this curve. 
So I'll just choose a random point on this curve where I'll calculate the instantaneous speed. So over here, I choose this point x0, y0 where I'll be calculating the instantaneous speed. In this situation, I'll be doing a small thought experiment. I'll be taking these two points x1, y1 and x2, y2 and bring them closer to x0, y0 while keeping them on the graph, on the purple graph as shown here. So if, uh, if I do that, I'll essentially be moving both these points closer to x0, y0. After a period of time, these two points will be so close to x0, y0 that the curvature of the curve will no longer matter and it will appear as if these three points is, uh, are on one straight line. The same can be represented by this diagram as shown here. This is the point x0, y0, this is the point x2, y2 and this is the point x1, y1. And these appear as if they are on a straight line because they are very, very close. Also, when they are very, very close, the value of delta x will almost become 0. So I can write it as delta x tending to 0. Similarly, value of delta y will also almost become 0. I can write it as delta y tending to 0. So in this situation, if I apply the formula for rate of change, I can simply call it once again uh, delta y by delta x just like I obtained it in this formula. The only difference is that delta y and delta x are extremely small. So writing the same thing, I can say that the instantaneous rate of change, why instantaneous? Because the separations are so small that it will just pass in an instant. So I can say instantaneous rate of change of y with respect to x is simply delta y by delta x when limit delta x tends to 0. That limiting condition, that extreme condition when delta x is almost become 0, tending to 0, in that situation this ratio will give me the value of instantaneous rate of change. This same expression can be written as dy by dx. The symbol small d represents infinitesimally small changes. It's opposite to the symbol delta that represents large changes. So delta y by delta x when limit delta x tends to 0 can be written as dy by dx. Now at the end you can see there's an x equal to x0 symbol. This simply represents dy by dx or the rate of change of y with respect to x instantly at the point x equal to x0. So if I calculate the value of this expression, I will get my instantaneous speed at this point x0, y0. Now, if we graphically see, you can also observe a red line that I have drawn just touching x0, y0. This line here is simply this black line brought all the way forward uh, as a red line. How did it come forward? As I brought my points x1, x2 close to x0, what happened was this black line also started traveling along the graph and it ultimately came down to the point where it is uh, shown as the red line. This red line is the tangent to the curve at the point x equal to x0. A tangent is simply a line that touches a graph at only one point. So over here this red line is touching the graph only at x equal to x0. I hope these ideas are clear to you. Now let's discuss the major points that we learnt in more detail. So over here I have a x versus y plot where y equal to fx is drawn as shown in the figure. I have a tangent drawn in red at the point x0, y0. The tangent is making an angle theta with the x-axis. So I can say that instantaneous change of y with respect to x at any point in general can be given by dy by dx formula. At the specific point x equal to x0, the same instantaneous rate of change will be given by dy by dx at specifically x equal to x0. The way we write mathematically is in this form. And this dy by dx value is also equal to tan of this angle theta. Now why is it equal to this? Because we know that the slope of a line can simply be represented as tan of the angle it makes with the positive x-axis. So I can say that dy by dx at x equal to x0 is nothing but the slope of the tangent at the point x equal to x0. Now, dy by dx equal to tan theta keeps changing as x0, y0 changes, which means the slope of the tangent or the value of dy by dx will keep changing as I keep varying my point x0, y0 on the graph. So it is never constant. If it was constant, the graph itself would have been a straight line because only for a straight line dy by dx is constant throughout the uh, plot. So summarizing what we just learned, I can say that the car's average speed can be given by delta y by delta x 
where delta y is a large change in distance, delta t is a large change in time. The instantaneous speed of the car at any point of time can be given by the formula dy by dx which is small change in y upon small change in x. If the plot or if the graph of the motion of the car is known, then dy by dx at x equal to x0 will give me the value of instantaneous speed and which is also equal to tan theta which is the slope of the tangent drawn at x equal to x0. Slope is the measure of steepness of a curve, you will study about this in more detail in mathematics. For a line the slope is constant, just the same thing I was saying in the last section and for more details the topic of maximum minima will explain the same thing. So over here we have the first function y is equal to c where c is a constant, derivative of y with respect to x is 0. So from here we know the derivative of a constant with respect to any other variable simply comes out to be 0. Next y equal to x raised to power n when I have a polynomial function, derivative of a polynomial simply comes out to be n x raised to power n minus 1 when my function is x raised to power n. Next y equal to e raised to power x which is an exponential function, derivative of e raised to power x is simply e raised to power x back again. Next y is equal to a raised to power x another exponent, the derivative simply comes out to be dy by dx is equal to a raised to power x into ln of a where ln is the natural logarithm on the base of e. Next y is equal to ln of x or log of x base of e, the derivative simply comes out to be 1 by x. Next y is equal to log of x on the base of a, the derivative of this function simply comes out to be 1 by x ln a. Now we will talk about derivatives of some trigonometric functions. Over here you can see y is equal to sin x then derivative of sin x comes out to be cos x. Similarly y is equal to cos x its derivative comes out to be minus of sin x. Next y is equal to tan x derivative of tan x is simply secant square x. Next y is equal to cosec x derivative comes out to be minus of cosec x cot x. Similarly y is equal to secant x derivative comes out to be secant x tan x. And for y is equal to cortex, derivative comes out to be minus of cosec square x. All these formulae are very important for solving problems in physics and as a student you must remember them. Now we will talk about some addition and subtraction rules that we use while we are differentiating multiple functions. So over here I have two functions fx and gx that I am taking under variables u and v respectively. If I have to carry out d by dx of u plus or minus v, in that situation the formula simply comes out to be du by dx plus minus dv by dx, which means the operator of differentiation can simply be distributed among both the functions. Next when I have u multiplied to v, d by dx of u multiplied by v simply comes out to be u into dv by dx plus v into du by dx. Next d by dx of u by v comes out to be v du by dx minus u dv by dx upon v square. These formulae also are very important and they will be frequently used. Let us talk about an example based on the formulae that we just learned. So over here I have a function y is equal to sin x plus x cube ln of x plus e raised to power x tan x which I am supposed to differentiate with respect to x. So over here I can write this uh, expression in this format because I know that the derivative operator can be distributed among the functions. Carrying forward the operation, I can actually apply the multiplication rule in this situation and I can say this can be written as ln x into d of x cube by dx plus x cube d of ln x by dx. The formula u dv by dx plus v du by dx, the same formula can be applied for the third function as well. Making the calculations, putting all the values, this is the final result I obtain. We encourage the students to carry on the calculations by themselves and then cross verify their answers from here. Now let us talk about the next important rule in differentiation which is called chain rule. Chain rule is applied in the situation when we have a variation like y is equal to f of t and x equal to g of t which means the variable y varies with the variable t as the function f and the variable x varies with variable t as the function g. If I have to calculate dy by dx in this situation, how do I go about it? Chain rule comes into picture then. So over here you can see if I have to calculate dy by dx, I can interpret dy by dx as dy by dt into dt by dx. I have simply multiplied and divided the entire expression by dt. In that situation I can write dy by dx as dy by dt into 1 by dx by dt because I have simply reversed this fraction. 
now because I know the functions uh, for y versus t and x versus t, I can easily calculate these derivatives and I can finally obtain my dy by dx value. Let's talk about an example for the chain rule. Let's say if I have y is equal to sin t and x equal to cos t and I have to differentiate y with respect to x which means I am supposed to find dy by dx. How do I do that? I have to simply multiply and divide by dt first and I will put the value of y and x also. So the value of y is simply sin t and value of x is simply cos t. Now putting the formula of differentiation I can simply say d sin t by dt comes out to be cos t and 1 upon d cos t by dt simply comes out to be minus of sin t. So doing the calculations further I can see that the answer comes out to be minus of cot t which can be written as minus of cot of cos inverse x because here t is nothing but sin inverse y and t is nothing but cos inverse x also and also it can be written as minus of cot sin inverse y. I hope these ideas are very very clear to you. So summarizing what we just learned I can say that differentiation is a vast branch of mathematics extensively used in physics. The method of differentiation is used to find the rate of change of one quantity with respect to the other. For a function y is equal to fx, its derivative is defined as dy by dx which is the symbol we use to show differentiation. The symbol dy by dx at x equal to x0 represents the slope of the tangent at the point x equal to x0 on the curve. Formulae for calculations of derivative must be properly remembered by the students because they will be repeatedly used in physics. Thank you.